welcome uh, everybody. My name is Algis Glucas and this is the 20th uh, in the What Talk series. It's my pleasure and privilege to give the talk this time. And I'm uh, going to talk about um, the wading hypothesis in more detail than I did before. So um, I'm just going to go through the PowerPoint slides as, as per usual and uh, go through them all. So this is basically the outline of my talk. So I'm going to try and justify why it's me again. That's the second one I've given. Uh, I'm going to start talking about what, what's wrong with the aquatic ape theory uh, in the early days or what might be wrong with it. Uh, one of the uh, reasonable critiques of the theory, which I believe was, was reasonable, uh, and that is the it didn't uh, in the early days use the scientific method. And uh, so why do we need to do that? And basically, that's what I've tried to do in my in my time uh, looking at this idea. When I return to academia, that's what really what I wanted to do. So in a nutshell, this talk is going to go through six uh, falsifiable predictions that the wading hypothesis makes and the sort of scientific analysis I did of those uh, falsifiable predictions and, and, and basically to say that they all were uh, past the test. They, none of them falsify, were falsified. And then just going to finish off looking at other waterside hypotheses of human evolution, which might be tested in a similar way. And then I'm going to end with the great words of Philip Tobias, uh, which I always draw strength from. So why me again? Well, I gave the first one, first what talk back in November 2021, and then it was really introducing the whole series. So well, I did spend about 15 minutes talking about the wading hypothesis, but I felt that I, I really want to give it more attention this time. And I want to talk about the scientific method because I think it's something that we don't talk enough about, uh, particularly in aquatic ape circles. And it's something that I think is it was quite rightly criticized in the early days. Uh, and, and I think we need to address it a little bit more. It's a very simple algorithm, the scientific method. And if it's used dispassionately, I think it can solve any problem thrown at it. And one of the great things about human society and all the technology that we've got and, and the brilliant things that we take for granted now is largely due to this, this method, which has been practiced for, for hundreds of years. And I've got real faith in this, uh, this method, the hypothetical deductive method, that one day it will show that Waterside hypotheses are broadly correct. That's what I hope to try and uh, sort of persuade you about anyway. So what's wrong with the aquatic ape theory? Well, it, as it was originally promoted by Sir Alistair Hardy, um, it, it was really just a, a, a request for comments, really. He didn't propose it as a formal uh, hypothesis, and he certainly didn't do any hypothesis testing. And Elaine Morgan, uh, quite rightly, followed in his footsteps. I mean, uh, to be fair to Elaine, she wasn't a scientist. She was a, a, a very good academic and did some brilliant writing. But she, again, she didn't really ever phrase it as an aquatic, uh, as a sort of a, a testable hypothesis. Um, uh, Alistair Hardy only really asked, was man more aquatic in the past? Uh, he didn't really go into very, you know, very much detail about how much more. And uh, so we're, we're kind of left with this idea uh, that was kind of uh, formally uh, quoted uh, by Desmond Morris. He was the first person to sort of call it the aquatic ape theory. And so it leaves us thinking, are we talking about apes only? Or are we talking about homo? How much aquatic? were we and and when and was there a u-turn all of these questions that sort of left hanging and we need to sort of have some way of answering them so 25 years ago i returned to academia to ucl in london to try to find out why elaine's brilliant work had not be, be, been given more attention now uh, a few weeks ago we had a few months ago a couple of months ago we had vernon uh, giving a, a lovely talk or a conversation about this book, uh, the Aquatic Ape Factual Fiction Road et al., the Proceedings of the Valkenberg Conference. And uh, it's a really great book. It still is one of the best books, if not the best book, certainly the most balanced book on the subject that, that, that there is. And in this book, there were some really good chapters. And one of them, which I have to admit, was a pretty good critique of some of the points in the Aquatic Ape Theory by Holger and Signe Prushoff. I hope I've said that pronounce that correctly. But basically, they wrote a chapter critiquing the aquatic ape. And this is the main thing that I picked up on. Uh, the weakest point of it 
was that its proponents do not develop hypothetical explanations that can be tested on the basis of known laws or on empirically established uh, rules. So it's this critique that uh, the epistemology, in other words, the way that we do science in the aquatic ape field, uh, wasn't kind of stringent enough, or wasn't sort of uh, robust. It wasn't sort of putting it in a scientific way. And when I read that, I thought that's pretty fair, actually. So when I started at uh, UCL, I wanted to try to do something about this and try to address it. So what are we talking about, the scientific method? I remember when my first few weeks at UCL, we did this in quite some detail. And basically, it's uh, th this thing called the hypothetico deductive method. Uh, and largely, you know, one of the main proponents of this sort of idea was Karl Popper. Uh, so Popperian uh, science is kind of the, the idea. And basically, in a nutshell, it's saying you can't prove things, but you can falsify things. And uh, over a period of time, you come up with a hypothesis that is robust. It's, it has not yet been falsified. And basically, you start with an observation. So you make an observation about the world. And then you come up with a, a kind of an explanation for it. Now, in biological sciences, we might have a proximal uh, explanation, which is something like a particular hormone might cause an effect or uh, a particular behavior might cause an effect. But if we're talking about biology, we usually want an ultimate explanation, which is more long term. And, you know, what's the real reason for this? And we, it's usually couched in terms of trying to do with evolution and, you know, natural selection. So ultimately that's what we're kind of looking for uh, and if you follow the scientific method you then develop a series of testable uh, predictions now the key word here is that they must be testable they must be presented in a way that can be falsified there's no good it's no good proposing an idea that you were kind of couching in terms that can't really be made to look bad you know you you should be if you're a good scientist be trying to knock these ideas down so that you can then use this method to come up with a better hypothesis. And, and, and that's the problem. I don't think many people have been doing that. Uh, so I've tried to do that. And, and, and so having come up with a testable, falsifiable prediction, you then objectively look at the data, maybe experimental data, or maybe looking at the record in the, in the fossil record or whatever, to see if this hypothesis can be overturned. You're looking to break the hypothesis. It has to be that way round. And then you ask the question, did the tests get confirmed? If the answer is no, you reject the hypothesis uh, or you revise it and you start again. It's an iterative process. It just goes on and on and on and it's never ending. If the test is OK, then you elaborate the hypothesis. You might go into more detail. You might pose another question or you might revise it in a different way but sort of making it more more uh, go a bit further and it's sort of going in little baby steps until you get a really robust hypothesis so this is the scientific method in a nutshell and this is what i try to apply to this so-called aquatic ape theory in the wading hypothesis so uh, aquatic uh, hypotheses are a little bit too vague and there's not that there's there's many of them, I think, and that's why I basically came up with this term waterside hypotheses of human evolution, because there are lots of different ideas. And each of these ideas, I think, can be phrased in a way that can be falsified and, and, and then tested properly. So that's kind of the idea of, of, of the whole thing. Now, I should say before going on to this critique of the aquatic ape and the, the sort of falsifiable predictions, it's, I think it's true to say that the Savannah hypothesis hasn't really been rigorously tested either. Uh, certainly not uh, as, a, as a sort of a, a specific paper. If you do a lit review search and you search for, you know, what papers are out there that have posed the Savannah hypothesis as a, a, as a, as a hypothesis to be knocked down, I, I don't think you can find one. I'm not saying that there's no good science being done. There's been lots of good science on various hypotheses but not really this broad consensus about the savannah, which is, is basically the model that we're all taught. And I have to say, all over the world, certainly at my university and at UCL, the places I've been to, it's still taught today, pretty much as, as a fact. So even though uh, it, it's easy for us to say, well, the savannah hypothesis hasn't, hasn't been uh, treated properly this way, so we don't need to, well, I, I think we can do better than that. Two wrongs don't make a right. 
and I was determined to apply the scientific method to you know my, my input as much as I could could anyway. So let's go through this then. I'm talking about the wading hypothesis mainly, uh, the, the idea of bipedal origins. So you make an observation and it's pretty stark. You know, you look at the gorilla and you look at the chimp and you look at a human and we are obviously the only biped. We are obligate bipeds. We move around on two legs pretty much all the time. I would say to the nearest uh, percentage point, uh, most humans, in fact, probably all 99% you know, of humans on the planet move bipedally pretty much all the time. Uh, now, with chimpanzees and gorillas, obviously, there's a, a locomotor repertoire that's a little bit more complicated. They do a lot of climbing. They're sometimes bipedal, but pretty rarely. But I would say that most of the time they're quadrupedal. Now, the, the really interesting thing here, which I think is really something that we should pay close attention to is this bit business about genetics so if you look at the dna or any of the molecular data there's no doubt that humans are closer to chimpanzees than chimpanzees are to gorillas so we are very tightly embedded into the african ape clade uh, and and therefore we we are basically african apes uh, in my opinion now in terms of bipedalism nobody would doubt no one would argue that if you go back far enough in time our ancestors were arboreal you might have to go back to the time that our ancestors were monkeys uh, but certainly uh, early apes were probably arboreal as well and there's no doubt about that i don't think anyone would dispute that and as i've just said i don't think anybody would doubt that we are pretty much terrestrial today at 99.99 99 percent of the time and most of the assumption in this so-called savanna theory is that there was kind of a, a transition from arboreal to terrestrial uh, in a kind of a straight line. Gradually, the, th the trees thinned out and our ancestors were, were sort of obliged to move more on the land. And for reasons not quite well defined, we decided to move bipedally. So this is kind of the orthodox model. There is no water involved here. And what the wading hypothesis basically adds to the picture is a wading component and we're not talking about a huge diversion here uh, it's still arboreal and it still ends up terrestrial it's just that there was a component of wading now uh, how much of a component is a question that obviously different people disagree about but to me it doesn't need to be very much at all and if the if it was that we moved down from the trees and then started moving through water, or if we originally moved through swampy trees, uh, swampy forests, so there was a wading climbing component, either way, that works for me. But uh, clearly today, we don't do a lot of wading. We are terrestrial bipeds. So this is the model that needs uh, explanation. So we have an observation and we have an explanation. Now, uh, for my master's thesis at UCL, uh, I did a, a set of experimental tests that were basically based on falsifiable predictions. And I came up with some theoretical tests, which was just really uh, evaluating the, 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 the uh, wading model uh, in theory. And when I did my PhD at UCL, I kind of did a little bit more of the experimental tests and I put all the theoretical ones together. So this is what I want to now look at for the rest of this talk, or most of it anyway, are these six predictions that basically I came up with. Uh, and these are all falsifiable predictions. These are all predictions that could have been wrong. Uh, I mean, I had a pretty good idea, to be honest, obviously, that they were going to be right. Uh, but I tried to pick ones that you know could be falsified. So I'll just quickly go through these. So the, the first one is that wading, bipedal wading should be clearly demonstrated or demonstrable in extant apes. It should be very easy to compel an otherwise quadrupedal ape to move bipedally in shallow water. The second one is that wading should reduce the cost of non-optimal bi bipedal gates. So the idea here is that uh, ima imagine the first hominid that started to move bipedally. It certainly couldn't have been anatomically adapted to efficient walking like we are. It, it didn't have a valgus knee, it didn't have um, a, a bicondylar angle, it didn't have a fully upright uh, spine. 
the acetabuli were were not arranged in such a way to make walking efficient like like it was for us so the early bipeds must have been quite inefficient compared to us when they move bipedally so the wading hypothesis would say that the earliest bipeds inefficiency would have been cushioned to a degree by moving through water so that's a second prediction a third one and this was a bit of a no-brainer is that uh, it should be demonstrable that uh, wading in certain depths is faster than swimming and i just really thought to put this in because most quadrupedal mammals don't ever go bipedal they start swimming if you imagine you put a dog or a cat in water it's going to go from quadrupedalism to swimming and it won't do the bipedalism so i wanted to just to test the hypothesis that wading is actually faster than swimming at least in some depths the fourth one <clears throat> is that uh, australopithecus afarensis lucy the peculiar shape is compatible with wading it could be explained by wading now whether or not you think australopithecus afarensis was ancestral to humans or to chimps or to gorillas it's still valid because at some point in the past either our ancestors or their ancestors were moving bipedally clearly in a way that was different from us and so it's still relevant to ask the question was australopithecus afarensis a wading ape and are there clues in the pelvic structure to show that the fifth prediction uh, is that early bipedal hominid paleo habitats should be conducive to wading so clearly they should be swampy they should be riverine or there should be a significant amount of water around for these fossils so so as to compel them to move bipedally uh, a lot of the time and then this final one is a more of a theoretical one but it's basically that wading models should be pretty good overall if you wade them up they should rank pretty well and that was the, the sixth prediction so i'm just going to go through these now uh, in a little bit more detail and just talk about the sort of things I did to, to test whether this hypothesis was falsified or not. So the first one uh, is this, that bipedal wading should be uh, demonstrable in extant apes. So I went to uh, the Plankendal Zoo in Mechelen, just down the road from Mark, and I had the pleasure of spending uh, an afternoon with Mark, uh, being terrorised by his dog. <laughs> It this huge dog, uh, really scary. It, uh, I still have nightmares about it even today. I'm sure it's a very friendly dog. But anyway, so uh, uh, basically, I did a study of these uh, bonobos uh, who ha uh, live at this at uh, this um, uh, lovely uh, enclosure, which of course is surrounded by a moat. And basically, the uh, the bonobos very rarely went into the water, uh, but sometimes children would throw food and i honestly didn't influence them in any way but i made sure i was around when kids that were likely to throw pieces of food uh, might do so and i managed to capture a few moments on video and you can see here basically look at this 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 female called hermion she's quadrupedal on land she goes into the water and she goes bipedal then back on land quadrupedal quadrupedal bipedal quadrupedal bipedal it's it's very clear if you look at the the data that i collected in water they were bipedal pretty much 90 percent of the time on land it was about two percent of the time it's quite marked now i have to remind everyone that at this time there was very little uh, anecdotal or otherwise data about apes moving bipedally uh, elaine morgan in a lovely book at 97 the aquatic ape hypothesis could only point to the proboscis monkey and third-hand accounts that they moved bipedally in the swamps of Borneo. So I was really excited to do this study, which seemed to indicate that it was true also of chimpanzees, or at least bonobos. But of course, since this time, there's been a plethora of video evidence and video and, and, and documentaries done, which show this beautifully. And you can see here, I don't have gorillas wading, but, I, but, but we've got the chimpanzee. This was taken from David Attenborough's documentary. We've got the bonobo again. This was uh, from the documentary that Richard Rangham did a few, a few weeks ago, a few months ago. 
and we've got this beautiful footage of an orangutan. Now, the point here about this is um, th there is no other scenario uh, that you could induce an extant ape to move bipedally without the use of the upper limbs forever. And, and this clearly does that. I mean, if this, if this swamp went on forever, uh, this orangutan could be, conceivably carry on moving bipedally as, you know, for, for, for days. Uh, and there, there's really no other scenario that can do that. Uh, Kevin Hunt uh, did a, a set of studies in 1994. Uh, he studied the chimpanzees in the Gombe. And basically he w watched them for 700 hours, noting down when they were bipedal. And he found that they were most bipedal, most often in trees collecting food. 80% of the instances were in trees collecting food. And he then used that to support his postural feeding hypothesis. Now, the trouble with that, though, of course, is in trees, if you're in a tree, you're holding onto one branch with a hand as you're collecting food with the other hand. And it's not really moving. It's just postural bipedalism. These guys are moving and it's without the support of their upper limbs. This is absolutely bipedal locomotion. And the wading uh, scenario is the only one that will induce that. So I think this alone should make this hypothesis the default hypothesis that students are taught. And clearly it passes that first test. OK, so what about the second test? The second test, remember, was that uh, the earliest bipedal apes would have not been anatomically adapted to moving bipedally like we are. They would be walking with a bent hip, bent knee gait or something that's a little bit inefficient. They, they would have been not as efficient as moving as we are. And so the idea is that water would cushion them from this inefficiency. That's the, that's the testable hypothesis. So I did a series of wading experiments. You can see here, this is a, a friend of mine, what called Warren at UCL and the swimming pools. You can see that sort of red uh, uh, string going across the pool. Uh, it was uh, sort of put at a certain height so that as you're wading, you keep your eye at the level of the string and so that you can flex your knees in a consistent way as you're moving across the pool. And he's breathing into a Douglas bag. So the idea is that the bag collects the air that is expelled and then we can uh, analyze it and see how much carbon dioxide is in there and therefore estimate how much energy you've been using whilst doing this wading. So this uh, study followed on from Carey and Crompton. Robin Crompton and, and his guys at Liverpool, uh, John Moore's University, published a paper just a few years before mine. And he did this study on a treadmill uh, with human subjects moving with a bent hip, bent knee gait at around uh, 50 percent uh, flexion and he found that the, the it was much more costly than moving fully, fully upright surprise surprise if you've ever tried it you know when they've got a minute try walking around with a bent hip bent knee for a few minutes and you find it's quite tough it hurts after a while uh, i always get my students to do it when we're doing bipedalism and it it, it does use up more energy there's no doubt about it and uh, crompton and carey use this to argue that the earliest bipeds must have walked like we did. So the kind of the kind of saying, well, because it's inefficient to move by with a bent hip, bent, bent knee gait, they must have moved with a fully upright gait, which to me is kind of strange. Uh, but of course, they're assuming it's on land. Uh, of course, they're not asking the question, could it have been in water? So I then based my study on this. So this was the experimental protocol. We've got lots of uh, volunteers. Uh, to, to, to participate, we measured all their usual stuff and we got them to move backwards and forwards, either on the side of a swimming pool or in a swimming pool. And basically there were three main dimensions that I, I measured. First was the knee flexion. So this is a, a, a human standing fully upright. That's at 30 degrees, that's 40, that's 50, that's 70 degree knee flexion. So you can see um, that's why we had to have that rope going across the pool to keep your eye at the right level. So you measure the knee flexion outside of the pool, and then I would set the height with the string going across the pool. So as they waded, they kept their eye at the right level to keep the knee flexion approximately correct. So that was the first dimension. The second one is depth. So either on land 
uh, at 0.96, 1.2 or 1.4 meters. So we varied the depth. And the other thing we varied was the speed. <laughs> Sorry about that. So anyway, so there's there's about 41 different permutations altogether that we could measure to, between the flexion, the depth and the speed. So this is the, the, the sort of the take home message. Here you can see on the left hand side, uh, moving on land, 50 degree knee flexion versus fully upright, 55% more costly than uh, than walking uh, with, a, with a normal gait. And this is just confirms Carey and Crompton's study. So we, we basically proved that they were right. And that's exactly, we got almost exactly the same data that they did. But look at this, in very deep water, 1.2 meters, there was no difference, no difference at all. And at shallower depths, there was again, the 55% uh, increase on, on land, but in water, it went down to 18%. So not much difference. So clearly the water is cushioning this inefficiency. Bent hip, bent knee gait makes no sense on land, but it could make sense in water. That's the point. And uh, this, uh, this uh, chart here shows increasing knee flexion. So on land, with zero knee flexion, it's, it's kind of normal walking. But as you have more and more knee flexion, you can see it gets more and more costly on land. But in water, the, the slope is pretty flat. So the point is, in water, bent hip, bent knee gait, or the more um, inefficient gaits are cushioned. It doesn't really matter that you have an inefficient gait. It doesn't matter that you're not yet perfectly anatomically adapted to bipedalism. The earliest bipeds would have been cushioned from, for still moving bipedally in water. And of course, in certain depths of water, they would have to move bipedally, otherwise they would drown. It's kind of obvious, really. Uh, test three, <coughs> we, we did this amazing uh, set of experiments in a pool in Amersham, not far from High Wycombe. We've got this amazing pool where you could vary the depth just to the press of a button. So we varied the depths. And basically, one of the things I wanted to find out was uh, I measured each individual volunteer's swimming speed. And then what depth of water was it uh, the, where, where there was a, a, the same threshold as the swimming speed? So you know, how shallow does it have to get before you can wade faster than you can swim? If you're wading up to your neck, it's really hard to wade and you, you go very slowly. If, you, if, if the water's ankle deep, obviously it's no problem at all. You can more or less run in the water, but there's got to be a depth which uh, where, where the, the swimming and the wading speed is about the same. And so this, is, this graph shows that threshold of the different volunteers. And basically, even if you're the world world's fastest swimmer, obviously there are going to be depths when it's still better to wade. So it's a pretty obvious point. But as I said earlier, because a lot of animals will switch from quadrupedalism to swimming, I wanted to make sure that, that, that wading was still optimal, even there at certain points. OK, on to test four. The fourth test is this business about Lucy's pelvis. Now, Lucy's pelvis, Australopithecus afarensis's pelvis, is weird. It's really odd. It's a complete outlier of all the primates. If I had lots of images of other primates, you know, like gibbons and, and uh, Circopithecoidae, you'd find them more like the chimp. In fact, they'd be longer in the AP direction, anterior posteriorly, and narrower laterally, even than a chimp. Lucy is at the other end of the spectrum on this uh, on this uh, sort of measure. Lucy is what we call a platypaloid pelvis. It's very wide side to side and very narrow AP. So how, what's that all about? No one seems to have asked the question, what were these guys doing moving? So I did a 3D geometric morphometric study of the pelvis. And I'll just go through this really quickly. It's quite technical. You don't really need to know all of this, but I just want to show you what we did. So basically, you take landmarks, common homologous landmarks on the pelvis, so different blobs on the ischial tuberosity, on the pubis, on the acetabulum, all the different parts of the pelvis, and you can then compare them with the different species. So we do a landmark schema. I then digitized pelvis. This is a, a cast of Homo erectus. 
And we then I then add, brought all the data into a database I wrote called MorphDB to collect all the data and do some basic processing. And then we spit the data out into a thing called uh, Morphologica, which is a brilliant program, which does all the clever stuff and analyzes the shape and does this, what's called a uh, uh, Procrustes analysis and all this kind of clever stuff. And basically you end up with a chart. Here we can see male and female pelvis, and we can see a, de a definite clustering. And if you look at the different species, so we've got over here, we've got gorillas and chimps, and here are humans. You can see that the Australopithecine pelvis is definitely closer to humans than it is to chimps and gorillas and orangutans. There's no doubt about that. But equally, it's quite distant. There's something going on here. It's not the same as a human pelvis. And, and as you, you can just tell from looking at the shape. So the second thing that I did was a lever arm study. So uh, when you've got a muscle uh, on a joint, the, the, the bigger the lever arm, the more purchase the muscle gets and the more powerful the movement is. So here, what I want you to do here is just purely looking at the shape of the pelvis, what does that infer about the movements that Australopithecus afarensis could do compared to a human? What, was, what, what, what did it give it extra lever arm to do in terms of movement? So the first thing I had to do was create this weird uh, pseudo landmark for the femur, the center of the, of the femoral head. And then basically I measured lots of points on the, uh, is, uh, the iliac blade where the muscles attach and calculate what the lever arm is of all of these different points. And then I analyzed them all uh, with, with software. And then I grouped them according to the different muscles. So we looked at the different load arms of where the muscles would be, and we looked at extensors, rotators, abductors, and uh, adductors, and to see if we can infer what muscles did the Australopithecus pelvis help. And, uh, and then I analyzed, analyzed them with a, an Excel pivot table. And basically, this is the punchline. The, the, as, as, you, as you could probably guess from the shape of the pelvis alone, uh, abduction and adduction. So abduction is away from the midline. Adduction is towards the midline. Uh, was benefited by the shape of the Australopithecus pelvis compared to humans, uh, and, and it was pretty clear that that's what it was saying. And also rotation. Now this is just uh, looking at the profile that a, a body, a human body, makes in the frontal plane compared to the lateral plane. So moving through water, clearly this is going to impart more drag when you're moving frontally than moving laterally. There's no doubt about that as well. And this is the calculation to work out the actual drag, the Ren ironically called the Reynolds number. So I don't know if ever you knew that, uh, that person, but Reynolds obviously <laughs> very famous involved there. So this is, the, this is the movement that I think they were doing. Or this uh, certainly it's consistent with their uh, the, 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 the shape of the pelvis. And of course, this works in water. This is kind of the, the side to side waddling gait that, you, that, uh, that this seems to be adapted for. So that was another thing then that I, that I think uh, passed that test. Uh, that it, it, did, it was definitely con uh, consistent with waving. So the fifth one then is the habitats, the paleo habitats. And basically, uh, you know, all of the paleo habitats, if this wading hypothesis were true, the earliest uh, hominid bipeds should be conducive with wading. And if you look at the Hadar habitat, this, this image was taken from Donya Hansen's book, Hansen and Edie, um, and it basically was a wetland for a million years. The, the, the Lucy habitat was a wetland for a million years. It was found with crocodiles, uh, turtles and so on. So you know why Lucy got its name, right? The Beatles song. Uh, so Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. But we should really start singing a different song here. Are you all ready? Lucy in the lake with turtles. That's what we should be singing, right? They were. It was discovered with turtles and crabs and crocodiles. And I think that makes much more sense. This next one. Uh, Sahalanthropus chadensis uh, was discovered where? In the Sahara Desert. But of course, when it lived seven million years ago, 
this was a huge lake and it was discovered right in the middle of that lake and it was uh, it was in a layer of uh, of rock that they called the AU the AU unit or the Austral and and the Anthrocatheriide unit what the hell is an Anthrocatheriide it's a hippo ancestor there were so many hippo ancestors buried with Sahelanthropus that they call it the AU, the, A, the Anthrocatheriide unit. Again, completely consistent with the wading hypothesis. And if you look at the, uh, go through the, the, the detailed literature and you look at all these different species, the early hominins, and you look at them and you, you, you read the text, they're all consistent with wading. I, I don't think there's a single example uh, that isn't. Uh, maybe late only, uh, but that's quite late. And even that, it would, had to be wet, otherwise the footprints wouldn't have been formed. So even 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 that isn't a, a very good one against. So again, I think test five was met. Now test six um, is a bit more controversial because it's theoretical. And I'm going to say, well, the wading model should be the best of all the models. So how are you going to judge that? And, you know, I, and I've got, heard a lot of criticism for this thing. You know, it's a bit subjective. How can I possibly evaluate these models? Well, anyone in academia knows that this is what we do. Uh, when you go to school and you have an essay marked or you go to university and you have a thesis marked or you do a master's degree or a PhD, it's marking written work. How? You come up with a marking rubric, which is kind of like the ideal answer. And then you grade it according to how it fits this criteria. So that's what I tried to do. Uh, the, the weighting models are very uh, low in popularity in textbooks. Only about one in five uh, human evolution textbooks uh, mention it, uh, and they don't give it very much credit. It's usually at the end of the list. But if you if you analyse the actual quality of the model, the weighting models I think are, are by far the best. So there are loads of models. There are loads of different ideas of, of bipedal origins, and you've probably heard of all of these. You know, falling preemption which just means carrying social behavior like the gorilla uh, postural display, you know, kind of banging the chest, uh, threat displays, uh, penile displays, all that kind of stuff. Feeding, I've already talked about that, Kevin Hunt and his uh, postural feeding hypothesis. The efficiency, people think that we just started moving bipedally because it was more efficient than quadrupedal. Uh, Kevin, uh, Peter Wheeler has this idea about uh, selection for better thermoregulation. So standing upright in the in the long grass meant that you place your body in the breeze and looking from the top, uh, there's less of a body profile. Uh, you're going to get less solar radiation. Of course, that relies on you moving at noon in the middle of the midday sun. Only mad dogs and Englishmen would go on the midday sun and go strolling around the savannah looking for food. Uh, I've have got this one called habitat compulsion. And basically in trees uh, and in water, you kind of are compelled to move by people. And there are some other weird ones as well that I won't bother about. But basically I did an analysis and this is my marking rubric. I'm gonna go through it pretty quickly. So I've got a category of Darwinian things. So the, whatever it is, it should provide a good survival value. It should you know, provide a good mechanism for survival. It should improve sexual selection or sexual uh, uh, you know, uh, success. It should not be teleological. It shouldn't be because we do it, then that's what the earliest bipeds should uh, have done. It should work all the way along from the very beginning to the very end. Uh, ecological ones. So it should improve food acquisition. It should help produce, uh, you know, for these, these apes to get food. It should account for predator vulnerability. So there's a bit of a problem here, obviously, with the wading hypothesis because of crocodiles, and I'm the first to admit that. Uh, it should explain why gre other great apes are not bipedal, uh, what happened to them. And it should provide analogous behavior in extant apes. Uh, paleontological, it should be consistent with the fossil record. It should explain anatomical ad an anomalies of the earliest hominins. And it should uh, have a good pre pre precursor to both knuckle walking and fully upright bipedalism that we have. And you know, following on from Pershoff, uh, 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 the, the two Pershoffs, it should be have good epistemological qualities. It should have an extended explanatory power, 
complementary to other models, shouldn't be exclusive, and it should be falsifiable and make uh, and make testable predictions. So this this was my marking rubric, and I went through all of those forty different um, uh, sort of published ideas on bipedal origins and, and rated them according to this. And basically, um, you if if you want to, you can go to this website and see my marks, and you can put your own marks in. And one of one of the things I'm most disappointed with, I did this in 2015. And I tried to publish up, publicize it. And you know, I have not received a single, not one reply to this. Uh, I mean, and my son did this. It was brilliant, a brilliant piece of work. It's a very robust web page. And anybody can go in here and put their own marks in. And then I've got a, a little thing that will then you can send that to me and then we can argue. I was anticipating a lot of people would criticize me and say, uh, oh, this is just biased. Well, I tried to be completely open and say, well, this is what I, this is my marks, put your own marks in, and then let's have a discussion as to why they're different. But nobody did, not one in 30, but what, nine years. So incredible, really. So this was the final table that I came up with, and the waiting ideas are the best. There's no doubt uh, in that they're the best ideas. Uh, I mean, you've only got to think of the first Darwinian one. Uh, Su su survivability it's the only model that would kill you if you were a quadruped right if you're wading in waist deep water and you were determined to move bipedally sorry quadrupedally you die it's it, it, it's such a clear-cut case anyway so all of the six tests then uh, i think none of them were falsified all of them were supported and so that then leads to, well, what more could we do? And there's a number of very interesting questions that still need to be addressed. For instance, was the last common ancestor already a wading, a wading climbing, uh, uh, in other words, aquaboreal ape? I think so, but we need to do some more testing there. Um, uh, another one that Richard Rangham would be very interested in, I think, is wetlands acting as a good refuge in times of aridity. And uh, I must admit, uh, that's something I didn't really look at, but there should be there should be some good ideas there to, for studying that. And what about thermoregulation? Rather than standing upright in the, on the savannah at, the, at noon, how about going for a dip? That would cool you down pretty quickly, I would have thought. And uh, so, but again, I didn't test that one. I didn't look at that one. And let's be honest, there are some problems with this. There's some difficulties, crocodile predation. How would the wading apes cope with that? That's another question that needs to be looking at. So basically, I think that the wading hypothesis meets a lot of these answers. I think a wading climbing uh, aquaboreal uh, last common ancestor provides a perfect precursor to both knuckle walking and to a striding gait. I think it works very well for that. And if you look down this list here, you can see that all of these testable uh, predictions are met. Uh, and some of the ones that I haven't tested are pretty likely to be met. So I think it's a pretty good hypothesis. If anyone wants to see a good summary of this, I did a poster presentation at Cambridge University uh, at the end of uh, 2021, I think it was. And I think this summarizes it all very nicely. And I'll put this online. If anyone wants a copy of the PDF, it summarizes the whole thing very nicely, I think. Okay, so, that's the waning hypothesis. Now, I think all of the different ideas uh, in the so-called aquatic ape can and indeed should be treated in the same way uh, and proposed as a set of falsifiable hypotheses, and then science could be done. I'm not going to read all these out. I'm sure you can see them there, but they're all plausible. They're all common sense. They're all testable. Uh, and there's a hundred PhDs to be done here. It's a scandal of piltdown proportions that this idea has been ignored for three generations. Uh, I mean, I did a PhD on my own back. I didn't get any encouragement from anyone. And it's scandalous, I think, that people in the field are not encouraging their students to do the science that they're supposed to be doing on this. It's a really good hypothesis. So why, isn't, why aren't these being done? So 
That brings me to the hero of this uh, plot, uh, one of the few scientists that has been prepared to admit he's wrong. I hope you can hear this. This is, uh, of course, the great Philip Tobias. I see Elaine Morgan through her series of uh, superbly written books presenting a challenge to the scientists to take an interest in this thing, to look at the evidence dispassionately, not to avert your gaze uh, as though it was something that you hadn't ought to hear about or hadn't ought to see. And those who are honest with themselves are going to dispassionately examine the evidence. We've got to if we're going to be true to our calling as scientists. Okay, so talking about averting your gaze. In the last 20 years, one of the most disappointing things for me is there's been a lot of mainstream gaze aversion. Dan Lieberman's endurance running persistence hunting hypothesis is uh, the cool thing to do. You know, you go anywhere in the world, this is, the, this is what people believe in. And it's particularly, uh, you know, horrible because this was the thing that Elaine Morgan so successfully railed against in, in her book, Descent of Woman, 50 years ago. And here we are, we're back to square one. Man the Mighty Hunter, again. Uh, and and it, I, it's just incredible how that's become the mainstream thing. This guy here, Jeremy De Silva, is, is kind of a quite, a quite a celebrity at the moment in the area of bipedal origins. He wrote this book called First Steps. It's a beautiful written book. I, I mean, it's very nicely written and he's, a lot of it's great but he obviously ignores the waving idea. And of us, uh, aquatic proponents, he says this, we're more interested in bullying the scientific community than, uh, in, than they are in framing aquatic ape as a testable hypothesis and attempting to refute it. Well, I've been trying to do that for 20 years, Jeremy. And when I tried to tell him that on Twitter, what did he do? He blocked me, blocked me, completely blocked me. This is, this is the response from the people in the field. And this is another one that makes me want to cry. Will Harcourt Smith, he did his PhD at UCL when I was there doing my masters. He definitely heard me speak on the wading hypothesis at least twice. And he's now a bit of a rising star in the world of bipedal origins. He wrote this uh, piece in the Handbook of Paleoanthropology, an origin of the bipedal uh, locomotion. So a summary paper. 20,000 words, wading is not mentioned once. And I've tried to write to uh, Will, and it must be a dozen times, probably 20 times, and he never replies, never. Uh, it's just it's just terrible. It, it's, it's a scandal. These are the people that are in mainstream gaze aversions. All of these people, they're all either opponents of the idea or they just ignore it. And when you try to write to them, they block you or they just ignore it. It's terrible. And, and if anyone uh, please watches this video, please share it with these people. And please, if you're watching this, uh, Owen Lovejoy, Don Johansson, Robin Crompton, Craig Stanford, Lee Berger et al., please do the honest thing and answer why you're ignoring this idea. What's wrong with the science that I've just done there? Is it really that terrible? I don't think it is. So <clears throat> referring to the thing that uh, Philip Tobias talked about, our call, calling as scientists. 25 years ago, I returned to academia to try to find out why Elaine Morgan's brilliant work was still being ignored by all these biological anthropologists. And I learned that there was no good reasons. Well, OK, maybe one, maybe one maybe the need to apply the scientific method that's a fair criticism but there were a lot of really bad ones a lot of vanity a lot of tribal bullying you know jeremy de silva accuses us of bullying well you talk to simon bearder about that bullying every day in his department at oxford brooks university he gets bullied by anthropologists who don't want to talk about the wading thing or the aquatic thing that's bullying, and he's had that for 30 years. These are the people that are not doing the scientific method. I'm sorry. If you're a proper scientist, 
you want to falsify your hypothesis, aren't you? Isn't that what you're supposed to be doing? Isn't that what the hypothetical deductive method is supposed to be? Well, who's been doing that when it comes to the Savannah theory? I don't think they have. It's a simple algorithm, and if it's done honestly, it can solve anything. It's a really great tool to use, and we should all use it. Okay, I'm going to finish with a couple of cartoons. <laughs> so, I, 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 when I was at school, I nearly got expelled for drawing cartoons about the headmaster. So I've always been a bit of a cheeky cartoonist. And so this is uh, Lee Berger, uh, Jeremy de Silva, Herman Ponzer, and uh, Daniel Lieberman. And of course, Daniel Lieberman's very keen to tell people how good he is at long distance running. He can outrun a horse. Well, of course, it's not rocket science. The wading hypothesis should be the default hypothesis, and it's long overdue. 60 years uh, this has been ignored, and it's long overdue. It got some decent attention. Here's another one. It's not rocket science. Okay, got some acknowledgements to do. So I want to just acknowledge, first of all, my lovely wife and my dear family for supporting me in my crazy adventures around the world. You know, they've always supported me, never criticized me for doing all this stuff. Uh, of course, dear Elaine, I, I'm totally inspired by her. I would never have started this if it wasn't for her. This photo was taken, just it's the last photo I've got with her just after a stroke. Uh, just a few months before she passed away. Uh, Charles Oxnard, he was the guy that got me over the line at, uh, at, UC, at UWA. If it wasn't for Charles, I don't think I would have passed. So good old Charles, he did a great job. And my other two super, my supervisors, Nick Milne, he was really great. He taught me all I needed to know about geometric morphometric analysis. He was brilliant. Uh, I, I, ne I never gave him enough credit at the time, but uh, if, if you're watching this, Nick, good on you and uh, also Paul Fournier, who was uh, a great uh, great proponent and uh, really supportive of all the wading work that we did. And of course, UWA, they're great. All right, so that's that. I just want to finish off by saying um, there's been a slight change in the program coming up. I've, I've made a mistake. I double booked, I think. Um, uh, so David Kim, uh, Kimber Holler uh, and Richard Rangham both were booked on the same day. I'm sorry about that. Uh, so we're going to have to probably maybe have two in September uh, to fit those in. I'm not sure. We'll we'll see if there's any if there's any uh, leeway there. But anyway, that's really great. It's going to be great to have Richard uh, give a talk for us in a few weeks. Next month it's Colin Hendry, who I must admit I know nothing about. But thanks to Mario Vanishu, uh, he he's a, a, apparently a proponent, uh, is a psychologist at Leeds University. So I'm going to look look forward to hearing from him. Okay, that's it. So thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing, and uh, if anyone's got any they want to say or question yeah, has, anyone, <laughs> has anyone sort of put the the same sort of hop, uh, hypothesis testing what you have done for the wading also on the uh, savannah theory and then posted to the proponents of the savannah theory and said well come up with the answer score yeah it would it would be great if if, if they uh I mean, I, I, I'm open. I mean, I might be wrong about this, but I, I, I've, I've kind of been searching for a good paper that tries to falsify the Savannah hypothesis, and I honestly don't think there is one. Hmm. <laughs> so, Malgozata, please, if you've got a question, um, just... Yes, thanks. I, of course, uh, really, this was really good. I remember parts of it in, uh, you know, from reading your your your, te your thesis, which I found very, very, very readable, to say the least. Really, really, I think it was really good with um, with all the data. It's not like uh, nice to read. It's, it's, it's the amount of you know measurements basically that that I really find nice. Um, but I'm. Uh, and I was thinking recently when you say, of course, we are adapting to, to running as well as for waiting. And I was thinking, where do I not understand? And well, I would say, of course, we are adapted to running. But uh, um, yeah, as, as you say, to, to think that we are, you know, that it doesn't, that we are adapted to do something, of course, it doesn't mean that, that it was the driver 
in our evolution, right? Precisely for the reason that you cannot, that we could not be efficient uh, bipedals at the beginning. It needs some mitigation. It's so obvious. So all you're saying is so very, very, very obvious uh, to me. And and in that sense only, I, I say that you know the uh, endurance running is rubbish. It is rubbish as a as a you know to, to claim that running was the driver in the evolution that we should walk precisely as we do now does not at all and it's an epistemologic epistemological error mean that we did well we didn't right and that's that's simple I don't really understand how people can claim things like this I have even to confess with all due respect. When I was reading this epistem, there is an epistemological uh, article in in Roberts' uh, Wade, and I found it. I'm not a philosopher, but I found it particularly poor. Uh, I mean, luckily I don't remember the the author, so I don't want to I don't want to uh, offend anybody. But I want to say one thing about uh, the epistemological thing because this is a very this is the very right postulate that you made the, the, the um, scientific method. Uh, but I was recently reading some Kuhn and actually I came across a passage when he points out to Popper then what he postulates is right, but this is, and Elaine actually says this as well, but this is not exactly how the science work, work. What, what, what is, how it works, how the society, how the scientific society works, is they would want, they would, as we know, and in any other so society circumstances, they would uh, defend a, a paradigm that they believe and that is working. The point here, which is particularly strange, that the paradigm is not working. They don't have an explanation for bipedalism, and they actually there is the only sensible idea is 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 the aquatic or, yeah yeah I, th I think you're right. I mean that 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 business of Thomas Kuhn and the mm -hmm. the, the, the process of yeah. scientific revolutions is really important and I think Steve Munro uh, in the third talk made that point that we are in paradigm paralysis here mm -hmm. that there seems to be a yeah. we're kind of stuck and and it's yeah. quite it's quite clear and and it's understandable i suppose you know if you've been working in a field for 20 30 years but for 30 years yeah. 40 years you you that's, you that's hard you, to... yeah the thing that's disappointing is that the younger generation uh, yeah. uh, really want to adopt the paradigm even with more religious fervor than the older people i mean the people like tobias and uh, oxnard uh, coming towards the end of their careers are quite open to this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. That's surprising. Do you want to say something? Yeah, but more? this may be another, you know, science, you know, so, social phenomenon that people, apart from doing a science, they want to have their status. Yeah. So, especially when they're earning the status. <laughs> it's kind of anthropological in the cultural sense and not in evolutionary sense. Well, yeah. maybe it's if maybe I have a tiny little spark of, I don't know, comfort or like really a grain of sand. Um, you know, I translated Elaine's uh, books to Polish and I am right now uh, correcting uh, my translation because there will be a second edition by a big proper publisher uh, in Poland. So I hope for a little bit of revival and it's actually and uh, in a series recommended by, by our recent novelist. And she likes the book really not for the evolutionary part, but for kind of so, social ins insights in, in, at the end of, of the descent of woman, which is a little bit about hierarchy, statuses, and so on and so on. So, you know, it should be, it should be out again in, soon, I hope. Uh -huh. So I hope, you know, for a little bit of more interest at least. Thank you. Okay, we'll look forward to that. Did you want to say something, Mark? Go on, Mark. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot for a very interesting uh, talk. Uh, but in my opinion, you have proven that the uh, early the ancestors 
of humans and apes were aquarboreal. They were wading, climbing. But then later came the, in my opinion, more real, more aquatic phase that uh, Homo erectus began diving, most likely for selfish. Eh? Homo erectus, we have a poor sense of, of olfaction, so we were certainly no hunters. Uh, Homo erectus also had a pachyosteosclerosis, eh? just very heavy and thick bones. And this is exclusively seen in tetrapods, eh? in, in mammals and birds and uh, reptiles and amphibians that that are shallow and slow divers. Those, there's zero doubt that Homo erectus was a slow diver. Uh, you're quite correct that the aquarboreal theory, uh, the aquarboreal phase was, was uh, Miocene and uh, Pliocene, uh, but the real aquatic phase of diving came well, probably early Pleistocene, we, we, we're not sure yet, so the Lucy was no ancestor of humans. Lucy was a, a relative, a fossil relative of gorillas, and uh, in South Africa, the Australopithecines were fossil uh, relatives of, of uh, chimps and bonobos. So there's no doubt that the uh, ancestors of the African apes, and also, uh, in my opinion, of the gibbons and of the orangutans frequently waded, but that's a common, that's before the more aquatic phase, phase of, of uh, shallow diving. So there are different steps, eh? arboreal monkeys, let's say, then we had the aquarboreal wading, climbing, vertical, eh? climbing in the trees above the water, uh, most likely coastal forests, that's Perhaps why there are so few fossils. And, uh, they follow the Indian Ocean coasts. We have Homo erectus, early Pleistocene, and uh, there is zero doubt that Homo erectus was a shallow diver. The Pachia osteo, uh, his heavy bones alone prove this, but also all the rest. Uh, another remark is that, uh, well, the the pelvis was very interesting the, the illustration you that see us of the pelvis but the uh, iliac elongation was probably very late after the split with uh, with humans and uh, humans also had a very broad lateral laterally broad pelvis uh, but not, uh, it was Lucy-like, certainly, and, uh, but the apes evolved into lengthening the iliac, the iliac uh, bones, and we uh, took another way. Uh, well, shin bones, you say uh, about wading, but uh, Australopithecines and uh, apes have shorter uh, tibias, and still uh, Neanderthals have shorter tibias than, than we have. Because there is a, a rather late Pleistocene elongation of the tibia, uh, probably an adaptation, not, uh, not to diving, to, to wading, but to walking and uh, on land. So, thanks again for your, your speech. You have beautifully uh, proven that the, uh, the Miocene uh, hominoidea, the, the early apes, were waders, climbers. Thanks. Well, well I, I think, Mark, that I don't think we could ever say proof. Uh, the, the, we, we, certainly well, it's, it's clear. Then, when we take whole, all whole... Uh, everything together, there is zero doubt. Well, uh, that, that, that's the, I think that's the point of this hypothetical did well we have so many indications that that proven. you can only disprove and and you know when it comes well, in to a sense the... yes but there is no disproof so it's, it's uh... well yeah i mean when, when it comes to the 
the Homo erectus uh, grade hominins. I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of going along with you to a large extent, uh, and uh, but the, this business of the pachyostasis, uh, it, it seems to me it needs to be tested. So we need to come up with some falsifiable predictions and then make some do some studies. So there's a PhD to be done there by somebody. Okay, but uh, we not only have the pachyosteosclerosis, it's exclusively seen in shallow divers. But I'm not sure, is, is it all only in salt water or also in fresh, much less in fresh water, but is it salt water? Is, but is the, that's what I'm not certain about. But we have well, an external nose, we have the, the, the classic uh, or classic uh, arguments, we have uh, or nakedness or, or fat, uh, uh, subcutaneous fat, uh, we were semi-aquatic uh, not so long ago, Pleistocene still. We have the shell engraving that, that, that Stefan Munro found and we have so many, so many indications well, but I, I mean if i could just play devil's advocate for a minute okay i mean it, i mean a, a, a testable prediction of that hypothesis would be if homo erectus was really so adept at diving don't you think they would have crossed the wallace line and wouldn't they have gone up all the way into australia wouldn't they have gone into america I mean, they had a million, <laughs> no, two, no, two million no. years uh, of this uh, diving, no, no, no. and they never even crossed the Wallace line. So, uh, well, the Flores, we have, have, have Homo floresiensis. They crossed 18, at least 18 kilometers of sea. They were rather strongly, uh, mar marinely adapted. adapted. Uh, you have Homo floresiensis, as you know. Huh? Well, I think we, I think and even if there were no fossils in Australia, that says nothing. Eh? <laughs> yeah, well, can I come in here? Um, yeah, I'll Bernard. Just... Hello, Bernard. What you got to say? Yeah. So, you... Um, well, firstly, brilliant exposition. Thank you so much. Very much approve of your method, the, what you're calling the scientific method, which is the scientific method, of course, if we follow Popper. And definitely, um, if we can get the hypothesis into shape with experimental settings so that we can put the forward the hypothesis in a testable form, find an experiment, perform the experiment fairly and properly, and then come up with a uh, a solution that way slowly by slowly we can put that wading hypothesis uh, into into a form which anybody all those lovely faces you showed at the end <laughs> would have to accept you know or do their own experiment to disprove it so i think you're on the absolutely on the right road there i'm very sorry that uh, People haven't responded, but this goes back to what we've discussed before, which is the, well, you know, I put it right back to Elaine Morgan being, firstly, being a woman and secondly, being a feminist and so on. But yes, so that, now, one thing, uh, just particular thing I wanted to, uh, occurred to me, when you were doing the work on the pelvis of um, Lucy, um, you found with your morphometric analysis that her gait was, when you described it, it was like putting one side of the pelvis forward and then the other side forward and so on as she moved through the water. And this uh, reminds me very strongly of um, the waddling gait of the human child. So mm. that um, mm. this would make her or let's say lucy's um uh, locomotion rather sort of pediatric in in its in its in its form and that's very nice because that does fit with a lot of other ideas about you know ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny and therefore our ancestors might be expected to show some um juvenile forms of 
uh, you know, structure and, and forms of behavior. So then, but all the, uh, so I think this is very good, strong evidence for a waiting phase of, of, of human evolution. And, and I, I like that very much. And, and I think that's definitely the way forward. Of course, there will be the Liebermans who say, yes, you've proved it for the uh, Australopithecines, um, but you haven't, uh, you haven't proved it, uh, you know, for humans. And um, if you take Mark Verhagen's view, then you certainly haven't proved it for humans because Australopithecines, in his view, led to the apes. Now, I actually disagree with Mark on that one. I feel that uh, the Australopithecines uh, led to hom hom hominim hominins. So I'm I'm of the opinion that you know that's that is a valid demonstration that our ancestors um, uh, did wading, and I find that pretty strong evidence. So I'm I'm, I'm very pleased about that. The other the other experiment you did was how the the walking in water uh, gave a cushioning effect uh, when the when the legs were when the knees were bent. And I found that very convincing, too, because in both cases, you're using absolutely, um, you know, not foolproof, probably, but but pretty tight scientific methods to test hypotheses. So I like both those points very, very much. And I think they're much more, um, much more persuasive to any scientist than uh, the more general um, hypotheses that uh, we've had so far. So great, great work. Well done. Thank you very much for the talk. Thank you, Bernard. Leslie, you got your hand up. Yes. Um, again, I'd like to add the congratulations to that fantastic talk. It's so good to see the scientific method laid out with those brilliant experiments. So well done for that. Um, one thing I just like to ask you is you talked about um, Alistair Hardy saying that we were more aquatic in the past, but how, um, what, how much of an influence do we need to have in order to have made us more aquatic in the past? Oh, that's that's a joy to my ears to hear that question. Um, I, that question wasn't staged at all. I can. <laughs> I, I, I want to show you something, right? I've got something I want to show you. So this this pic, this is this isn't this is me as a child. That's not what I want to show you. I want to uh, start this. Can you see that screen? Yes. Okay. So this. This is a population genetic simulator, and I, I always think that people miss this point um, on both sides of the fence. Um, how much selection would make a difference? Now, if you run a population genetics software like this, you can do thousands of individuals over thousands of years and see how much selection is needed for a gene to become fixed in the population. So. I always love to show this. And whenever I, my students, I always show them this when we do genetics. So I'm going to set up a run here. I've, not, I've just loaded this program. Uh, I'm going to do a new run, so a new run. Now, don't worry too much about the, the technicalities here, but basically you can put in the population size. Uh, so I'm going to put in 5,000. That's quite a large population, but not ridiculously large, okay? You can imagine a, a population of hominins living near the coast um, doing whatever or living by a lake or whatever. And I'm going to set the, the fitness of a particular gene to be pretty small. OK, so I'm going to say it's a half of one percent. So if you've got this gene, you get a half of one percent advantage over somebody who doesn't have that gene. That's tiny. That's tiny. Uh, so imagine that you're if it's running you're a half of 1% more likely to win the race than the next person. It's 50-50 pretty much, but you're slightly at an advantage. So it might be body hair, it might be infant adiposity, it might be the shape of the nose, it might be pachyostasis of the bones, whatever it is, right? Now, I'm going to also allow mutations to occur. So I'm going to put in a realistic number, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So one to the negative nine, 
for both mutating mutating in both directions so according to the literature that's a reasonable number so these this allele is going to be zero to start with so it doesn't exist and yet there's a one in you know a billion chance that it could happen and there's 5000 individuals and if the gene mutation does happen then they've they've got a, a half of one percent advantage over the ones that don't have it and i'm going to let this run for 20,000 generations so that's about a million years right now uh, i'm going to have 10 populations at the same time so that's what this software allows me to do and when i click okay it should start running so you can see these are the generations at the bottom and already some of these mutations have happened and they're starting to take off and what usually happens is as soon as they take off they reach close to fixation pretty quickly so there are 10 populations altogether i think one two three four five six seven eight nine are the other two going to go there's eight eight have gone the ninth is going yeah all ten all ten are gone so you can see within uh 11 what 10,000 11,000 generations so let's say what about 500,000 years every single one of these populations has got pretty much to fixation that that gene remember it, it started at zero and even if it arose it only gave them a half of one percent advantage and yet it still happened so I, I just think that's a really amazing point that most people just don't get it's, it's 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 something that Richard Dawkins is very keen on stressing slight selection will win as long as the population is not really tiny it's it's it, the the if you've got a population of 100 or so it, it can't win it drift will win but if you've got a population of the order of about 5,000 it's going to win and 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 so the amount of selection that Hardy might have been talking about is tiny if, if our ancestors went swimming once a week compared to chimps who never went swimming that's easily enough that's all we're talking about we're not talking about mermaids here that's the point that I think we, is, is often missed so thank you Leslie for that brilliant question I'm so pleased <laughs> that you asked it has anyone else got any points or comments Kathleen Lowry I've never we, we, I've never seen your name before Have you, are you would you like to ask anything or say anything um no I'm, I'm glad I sorry that I'm not going to turn I just you know I love the way you look if you roll out of bed on a Sunday morning now I I, I apparently I, I didn't get in, in time to see your talk but I'll watch it later on on youtube and i'm just really glad to know about this group i um i read a, i'm an anthropology professor at the university of alberta in canada oh, and i i read elaine morgan's book a couple of years ago now and i well maybe longer than that but i you know i i had literally heard that it was this crazy theory that we descended from dolphins so i mean her <laughs> her reputation is is atrocious <laughs> and that and that it's you know I, I think that's one of the problems that the the popular idea of what her ideas are is so misrepresents thank you her, her, well not the popular idea but the the kind of lazy scholarly so since then of course i've done probably what many of you have done which is read lots of her other books and and i um i think what vernon said I, I kind of have become interested in a series of, some of you may have heard of Maria Gambutas. She's, she works on a much later, she did archaeological work, but Maria Gambutas is somebody who has also um, did really interesting work, but was treated really dismissively within anthropology. But her ideas have recently been confirmed by ancient DNA analysis. And so I, you know, I, I think that the, the materials that you'd have to look at for Elaine Morgan's ideas are too old. I think the oldest ancient DNA has come from a, a million year old horse. But, um, you know, it, it can happen that just one scientific advance kind of changes. 
Kathleen, could you put that name in the chat so we can have a, a sort of... Oh, yeah. Record? That would be great. Um, so what, what this is music to my ears again. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, so uh, maybe you'd like to give a talk for us. <laughs> Not that we're desperate or anything, but... Uh, well, down the road, I'm, I'm working right now on a book, so I, I don't feel I'd be ready now, but maybe in six months. Yeah. Oh, so, but I, I'm I'm excited to catch up on the posted videos and participate going forward. So, thank you. No, oh, great. Well, thank, thanks so much for coming. It's a real pleasure to have new people, and uh, and thank you very much for your brilliant comments. It's it's music to my ears uh, to hear that sort of thing. So, thank you very much. Anyone else want to say anything? Uh, 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 Humphrey, go on. Yeah, do you do you have a good reference on this um, what you showed on the, uh, the 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 program you just showed where they said the the the, uh, the changes in the small genetic changes is that oh, yeah. oh, easy yeah. paper to read? Oh, well, it's not so much a paper; it's just software you can download. It's from oh. Washington State University. It's called okay. PopG. I'll put a I'll put a link on the website. But if you just Google okay. Pop Pop popg dot exe and then washington state university you'll see a, a page where you can download it it's really a little tiny little program and it's brilliant it's great for doing this mm. sort of thing and uh, and you can just demonstrate how little selection makes a big difference uh, in, in relatively quick amounts of time so I, I just think this is this is kind of the big thing people miss and, and when they, when you know, this ridiculous idea that we we evolved from mermaids. If you don't understand how evolution works, and you don't understand anything about population genetics, you might be tempted to think that we must have been like mermaids to have lost our body hair. But in fact, it, the the amount of selection is tiny, uh, and it would it can make profound differences very quickly. And, and I think that's the, kind of a really big point that has flown over the heads of too many people. Anyway, I just wanted to add to, to what you said that actually what the water, I mean, the water environment is actually the only one that that is not uh, penalizing uh, the lack of hair. So it's not about. I mean, it, this is. Yeah, sorry. I just I just wanted to to say that I like what you said. That's sorry. Fine. No problem. All right. Well, I think we should stop there then because it's, it's getting late. Is any is any any more final comments? Anyone want to say anything more to finish off with? I just want to say thank you very much for coming. Uh, I was very thank nervous, you. very nervous, but uh, thank you for making it nice and easy. Thank you. Right. Bravo.